That is a way too long introduction. <laughs> I should just get up here a lot slower, I guess. Um, I, I do want to mention um, that this week, we didn't make a big deal out of it, and we, pr- we should have. Um, our Spanish church is meeting for the whole service um, um, back in the multi-purpose room. And uh, Nellie was a little bit nervous about that, um, but they have uh, several that have come back there. And one of the things, we just figured it out, one of the things that was keeping um, some of our Spanish folks from coming was that they knew they would have to sit through a part of the service that they didn't understand. And so um, so she said, hey, we'll work out a way to have some music back there. And, and so be praying for them, be praying for them in the weeks coming up. And uh, remember, they are still part of our congregation uh, they, and, uh, and we, they are us. And so, um, so let's be praying for their ministry and all that is going on there. So, um, well, we are in this series, uh, God in your body, and this is the second week. We're going to talk about being extraordinary today. And, uh, we are talking about this series because in our culture, there's a lot of confusion, uh, about the body, about identity, about those kinds of things. And one of the things that I don't want to do in this series is stand up here and shout things or, or complain about our culture or whine about our culture and things like that. I think that kind of thing happens way too much. What I want to do while we're up here is to explain what is it that Christians believe and why do we believe this, this kind of thing? Uh, why is it for 2,000 years that we have have believed something about the body and about what we do with our body, that it is important and uh, that, that, that uh, we pay attention uh, to what we do with our body as believers. Um, our, we cannot expect our culture to follow suit. Um, they're, they're, they're not living to honor God. Um, and so we can't expect that they will. However, we can live in such a way that it makes attractive the the. Uh, uh, the reasons and the ideas uh, for why we we follow Jesus, and so uh, we want to want to do that. And uh, we said that we're going to uh, uh, put together kind of a theology of the body, um, as as it were, uh, a way of thinking about God, uh, a way of thinking about our body that honors God. And so um, the the very first point that we made uh, last week, the very first building block, was this. Um, that uh, the creation of the physical world is good and it can be trusted. Um, The second one that we're going to work with today is that our bodies are endowed with a significant purpose. And it's a purpose that you might not think of, but it is to serve as a, a mysterious pointer or a sign that points to prepare the human race to receive the presence of God in the incarnation. A lot of big words, but we'll unpack that and uh, make and use smaller words as we do that. Is that okay? All right? You all with me? Don't make me work this hard this morning, all right? I just had surgery like a week ago, okay? And I'm going to start playing on that if you're, if you're not going to be in this with me. This is all skate. I want to hear some of you laugh. I want to hear some of you say amen. And uh, probably one or two of you stomp out mad, okay? All right, so... One of the things that, I, that I, our culture has done to us is that we either, in, in, in our culture, we either put our, our bodies on a pedestal and worship them, or we view our bodies with shame. And it's very few people that have the kind of bodies that our culture says should be worshipped. And that puts most of us in a category where we believe our culture says that our bodies ought to be shamed. And I want to do a poll right now. I want you to be very honest. I want you to be loud about this. How are you feeling about your body, right? No, I, I, I don't want you to raise your hand or anything like that. I don't want you to raise your hand. Um, we, and so in our culture, we view ourselves, our physical bodies, at times with a great deal of shame. Uh, I haven't met too many people that that haven't thought, man, I wish I could just lose some weight. Or, man, I wish, you know, <laughs> my one ear wasn't higher than the other. Or I had more hair. Or I had less hair. Or I had a different color of hair. Or that my hair wasn't curly. Or that my hair was curly. It doesn't matter. Um, a, a, my granddaughter has this beautiful red curly hair. And she is two. So she loves her hair. 
But let me tell you what, I know what is coming. She will get to first grade and not everyone will have curly red hair in the first grade. And she will see all the kids with all the other colors of hair and she will assume her curly red hair is not beautiful. And I hate that that day is coming, right? Because I see it, it is gorgeous, it is fun. She wakes up and it's everywhere, it's just like this. And I just think, it's so delightful just to see that. I mean, I can't have a messy hair day like that. And, and, uh, and, and so, it's just so fun to watch. It's just nothing to be ashamed of with that. But our culture teaches us that if your, your body's not worship worthy, then it is shame worthy. But... One of the things that we need to get used to is the spectacularness of the ordinary. You see, Jesus came as a baby. When he came as a baby, angels had to announce his coming. You know why? Because he was a baby. And the only ones excited about another baby are parents and grandparents of the baby, right? Right? In order for the world to know that Jesus came, angels need to announce it because he was ordinary. And in fact, the prophets that spoke about Jesus coming said there was nothing about him that when you looked at him, you thought, oh, there's a special guy because he was ordinary. Jesus came in an ordinary body as our extraordinary God. And all the time in life, we believe that God will come to us in extraordinary ways. And we miss out so often on the extraordinariness of God, quite simply because he comes in very ordinary ways into our lives. We fail to realize the sacredness of our bodies because it seems so ordinary. So ordinary. Just Look at your neighbor and just tell them, look pretty ordinary today. Look pretty ordinary. Hey, don't slug them. Don't sl I know you wore your best. I know you wore your chief shirt. I mean, come on. It's clean, right? And last week, we, we brought this up just a little bit, but it makes a big difference. And our, our culture has bought into a, a certain amount of this. Uh, and, and so we need, we need to keep talking about it and talk about the ways... That our, our culture has adopted this thinking. But last week we said one of Christianity's early opponents was actually a group that wanted to co-opt Christianity. Because it loved the message of, of God among us. But it had trouble with the way that that message was being told. And it was this. It was Gnosticism. The Gnostics thought that all matter, all creation is evil. It explained the evil in the world by saying, well, we have bodies. And, and our bodies are made out of matter. And matter is evil. What's not evil, they said, was what was inside of us. That we each had a spark. We each had this identity that is inside of us. And that identity is pure. And it is spiritual. And it is 100% it is good. But our bodies, I mean, they're flawed. And the way the Gnostics knew that our bodies were flawed was because our bodies would break down. Our bodies will disappoint us. Our bodies at times look like our bodies do. And they thought, that's got to be evil. Now, I'm not old yet. I'm on the edge of it. I understand that. Don't laugh at me, Penny. Now, come on. But I have heard some of you that are old talk about being old, and you don't talk about it in glowing terms. Anybody here just fantastically excited that, that your hips are hurting, right? Or that you need a knee replacement. Or, or maybe that you've got another sur surgery coming up or something like that. Anybody excited about those things? And so we look at our bodies, sometimes the way the Gnostics look at our bodies and go, you know, I want to get rid of this one and whatever shiny old spiritual body God's got for us. Well, that's not Christianity. See, Christianity is this, that creation is good and evil in the world is because of sin. And what God wants to do is not only restore our souls, but restore our bodies someday. 
And we're going to see how that's really, really important. And so there is this difference between these two things. And the way that Gnosticism has creep, crept into our culture is through Disney movies. <laughs> it just has. Every Disney movie that I see is about some young girl that has this spark inside of her and everybody outside of her is trying to tell her what to be. But inside, that's not who I am, right? That's a little bit of Gnosticism. Now, there's nothing wrong with some of that message because there are ways that culture tries to twist us and bend us into being things that we're just not meant to be. But in the Disney movie, the way that you find truth is by seeking inside because inside is good and outside is not good and the message of Christianity is this that God created all things good and what is wrong with the world is sin in the world and sin has corrupted all things and so what is wrong with the, with us as people is that what is inside has been corrupted and it has corrupted the things outside of us so it's two different ways of coming at life it's two different ways of approaching the world. And it's two different viewpoints that, believe it or not, actually change everything. So, Gnosticism or Christianity in our culture is once again kind of buying into this Gnosticism idea that what I feel is what is real. So, we fail to realize the sacredness of our bodies because they seem so ordinary, but it is the ordinary in which God often comes to us in extraordinary ways. Um, in fact, one of the things, one of the statements that Scripture had to make was probably directed directly at this kind of thinking that was starting to bubble up, this kind of thinking that said the body is evil because it was not the way that they, they experienced Jesus. He came as a real person. They saw him. They walked with him. They, they talked to him. They smelled his breath. They ate with him. They saw him in action. And it didn't go along with his teaching as well. And so... One of his disciples, his name is John, wrote this about Jesus. He says, you know, when people are talking about Jesus, here's how you can tell whether they're talking uh, and, and they're true in their talk or whether they're just, just, just full of hot air. Here's how you can tell. Here's how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. What, what he was saying there is that there were people that were starting to say, you know, Jesus was so incredible and he rose from the dead, but it couldn't possibly have been a person because matter is evil. Yeah, that body didn't resurrect and it was God among us and God couldn't possibly have been in a body. And so it was just a spirit that was among us. The, the disciples said, no, it wasn't. He slapped me on the back. I saw his tears. He stood close enough to see blood and water run from his side. I watched from a distance as they wrapped his body and laid him in a tomb. You see, John tells us it's very important that we not just think of Jesus as some spirit in the sky, but that he was a real person like you and I. He was God in a bod. See, God chose the human body as the vessel of his most profound self-disclosure in Jesus Christ. In fact, in Scripture, it tells us that, that, that God's plan for Jesus to come in human form and to be our Savior, our Messiah, and to live among us was in the works before creation ever even happened. This was God's plan all along. And God chose and he, he, he decided the best way for people to know my love for them is if I come and be one of them. And what he chose, the vessel he chose to put him in is a body body like yours like mine 
Which means, you know what? Jesus probably every now and then woke up and stubbed his toe in the middle of the night. Can you imagine God dancing around in the, in the living room because he's just stubbed his toe on the couch? Can, can you imagine that, uh, that there were times when he had a pounding headache and didn't want to deal with the world? Can you imagine that there were times when he was thirsty and desperately needed some water? Can you imagine there were probably times when he was so hungry that he was just a little bit cranky like I get? Yeah. My daughter-in-laws love me. I, I, I love them too. They love me, but they all laugh because they know when it's getting way past dinner time because they say, I get a little bit cranky. No, I don't really. Do I? No, I would never do that. Well, so the whole principle is that, Jesus, that God so honored creation that he came and became one of us. No less God than he, he was, uh, but no less human than you and I are. And that's a term that we call the incarnation. Incarnation is that Jesus was fully God and fully human. He was God in a bod. In fact, Isaiah said, expect it. When the Messiah comes, you won't be able to tell him from anybody else because there's not going to be a halo above his head. He's not going to glow in special circumstances. He is not going to have, you know, I am God written across his forehead or anything like that. You're going to have to watch how he lives. You're going to have to watch what he does. You're going to have to watch uh, and listen to what he says. And then... Colossians tells us this, and we'll find this all throughout the New Testament. Colossians says that for in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The fullness of God in bodily form. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. God in a bod, in a very ordinary way. And it's important that we have this foundational idea and understanding of the body and that in its importance because we are told something about our futures that I think is so exciting that our world misses. And that is because Christ came, we have a future that he foreshadowed for us. Any, anyway, next. Um, our created bodies point to Christ's incarnation. Your body is a mysterious message that says, um, this is the vessel in which God will meet us. In fact, we call it a means of grace. A means of grace is anything that shows us what God is like. We, last week, we did baptism. And that is a means of grace. The means of grace shows us physically what it is like to become a Christian. That we die in Christ to sin. And that we are dead and buried with him. And then that we rise in new life. That we are washed clean in Christ and made new. We are a new being in Christ. Wasn't that beautiful last week to see people baptized and giving testimony that Christ has given them new life. When we take communion together, it's a very physical thing that we do. We take something very common like bread and very common like the juice and we gather together and we say this is the symbol of Christ's body and this is the symbol of his blood and a symbol is not less than what Jesus did. It is not the whole of what Jesus did, but it speaks of more than it actually is. In the very common thing of bread, we find out that Jesus broken body was broken for us. In the very common thing of juice, we find that Jesus' blood was spilt for us and for the remission of our sins for new life. And we remember his death and resurrection there as we anticipate his coming again for us again in those very common symbols. God meets us in the ordinary Another means of grace, and I tell people this all the time, is when we gather for worship together. And there's nothing more beautiful. I mentioned it this last week. When I see our kids 
raising their hands and singing to God and their eyes are closed and they are not looking around or anything else. I know they get on the floor and roll around once in a while. It's okay. I know that sometimes they eat cookies and we've got to vacuum that stuff up. I know it's okay. Believe me. Because when I see very ordinary kids waving their hands and worshiping to God, I've got to think that there is a spotlight from heaven that is shining down on them and tears from God's eyes are falling because he says, there's another one of my beautiful children who have come to see me this morning and I'm going to bless her. I'm going to bless him with my presence. It's a beautiful thing. Our created bodies point to Christ's incarnation. In fact, Scripture tells us that the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit is our bodies. Our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean we become God. That means that God takes up residence in our lives. That God instructs us with what to do and with what not do where where God empowers us to live for him if we will listen to his spirit speak that God lives within us and his blood courses through our veins God in our bond well that's very important because this next point is extremely vital and that is this that Jesus was so real That his suffering and his sacrifice were real. This was not a play God was putting on. Jesus suffered like you and I suffer. Jesus died like human beings die. It was agonizing, and I don't, put, I don't want to put uh, gross imagery on the death of Jesus or anything like that, but it's very important that you and I know that God didn't come in the body and say, you know, that part hurts, and so like I'm going to go back, and we'll leave the body here to suffer, but uh, God suffered, and our sins were placed on him. It's a real thing. It was not some spiritual being that they were placed on. It was our God who took on our suffering, who said, listen, you humans are not alone in your suffering. I am here amid the suffering as well. And in fact, I am not going to skirt that suffering. I'm not going to I'm not going to miss out on that suffering. You're going to know that I'm right here alongside of you suffering with you. It's hard for us to understand. Hard for us to understand. One of the things that I think that is so helpful for people, and I see it over and over again, is when they are going through something, a long-term illness or something like that, and they know they have someone there with them. Not somebody that literally feels their headaches. Or somebody that literally understands what it means to shake with them. But someone who doesn't walk away from that. Who doesn't look at that and go, that's too gross for me to see. I'm going to walk away. Jesus took on our pain and our sin for us. It's very important that we realize that he did that in a real body. We have... A suffering savior, not a superhero. See, Jesus didn't take a look at our suffering and go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on an Iron Man suit and I'm going to defeat this. You know what he didn't do? He didn't get mad and turn green and stomp all of his enemies. You know what he also didn't do? He also didn't craft a great big old hammer and decide, you know what? All my enemies, I'm just, I'm just going to flatten them all and tell some good jokes along the way as I do it. Jesus said, no, 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 no. The way my enemies will be defeated is that my enemies will throw their worst at me and think that they have killed me. And their last, their last weapon is death. Their, their biggest shot is death. The one weapon everyone is afraid of is death. 
and I will overcome their last weapon. I will defeat their last enemy. You don't have a God that just suffers, but you have a God that has suffered. And this is really important. It's important that we know his resurrected body points to our physical resurrection. Did you catch it? At the start of all of this, I said that your body points to the incarnation. It says that this is the way God came. But here's the story of Scripture. The story of Scripture is this, that His resurrection will one day be your resurrection and my resurrection. And we are not just talking about a spiritual resurrection. We are talking about a bodily resurrection. Theology, for a long time, uh, theologians have, have been trying to walk away from the physical resurrection of Jesus, saying, you know, who can believe in this kind of thing? I mean, once you get so smart, if you just still believe in stories, I mean, that's all right. But once you're smart, you've got to believe that it was just a physical resurrection. But no, I believe that Scripture needs us, wants us to understand, and the disciples wanted us to understand, no, his resurrection means that one day you and I will be resurrected as well, a bodily resurrection, at which some of us go, can't we choose the body that we get resurrected into? I mean, come on. I know there's all kinds of questions uh, that people have. What if somebody's cremated? I mean, how's God going to resurrect that? Let me just say to you, if God could form Adam out of the dust, don't you think he could pull the parts of your body back together and make it all work? Don't you think that can happen? Amen. Um, his resurrected body points to our physical resurrection, which means this, and this is so important, that God cares not just about your soul, but about your body as well. He wants not just to save your soul, but your body as well. He wants to save creation just like he wants to save people. God cares about the world that he created. I think we ought to care about it as well. He says, uh, scripture says this, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of, are of all people most to be pitied. Why are we most to be pitied? Because we're hoping in something that will never happen. But he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. And in that he is saying to us, the power that is in the resurrection is just the foretaste of what will happen for us one day. When the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and we will stand before Jesus and he'll say, hey, hey, look around you. I'm making all things new. Yeah. Hey, look in the mirror. Because <laughs> I started with you. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But you know what? Our culture is at war with this understanding. Our culture keeps saying, what I should trust is what's on the inside and not what's on the outside. What I should trust is my heart. Christianity keeps saying, oh no, you've gotten that backwards. What you can trust is that God created all things good and our hearts have been corrupted by sin and it corrupts everything that we do and we need our hearts repaired. We need our desires repaired. We need our affections repaired. You see, our culture believes that we can separate our inner self from our biological reality of the human body. That we should distrust its reliability and its trustworthiness. And you know why we believe that? Because these bodies break down. Because mentally and physically, things can happen to our bodies that will affect uh, how we operate, how we think, how, how, what our outlook is. You know, when we talk about the sacredness of life, we don't just believe it's the sacredness of the life of an infant. We believe the Alzheimer's 
Heimer's riddled mind is beautiful as well. It's broken, but it's beautiful. We believe that middle age is beautiful as well because it's part of the life that God created. We believe the child who's, who's got attention deficit disorder and isn't like the other kids and is wound up and can't handle loud noises and makes fits in the middle of quiet places sometimes is as beautiful as the well-behaved one because God created that child and the brokenness of the body does not mean that we cannot trust what God created. Well, um, let me talk about a couple of things here just real quick. Um, this distrust has led to widespread gender confusion. Therefore, terms such as gender fluid, polygender, non-binary, transsexual are used to describe how people feel in contrast with what their body says. And listen. If that's you this morning, if, that, if you're struggling with something like that, uh, uh, believe me, we don't look down on you, we don't fear you, we don't hate you, but we want you to know that we are looking at life from a very different point of view, from the exact opposite view that you are, that we can trust the way that God made us and that it's a beautiful thing. And that God will redeem both of our hearts and our bodies. See, for the Christian, the goodness and the reliability of creation means that these de developments have a moral aspect to them. It's not morally neutral. And that's not something that we can ignore. It's not something that we can just be okay with because it teaches us to distrust our God. Um... This doesn't mean that the church should reject struggling individuals or refuse loving pastoral care for those experiencing forms of gender dysphoria. But you know what? We also need to understand this, that Christians have a clear way that we care for these issues. We cannot care for them by looking at them and saying, no, this is a God-blessed good thing that someone is having is struggles with these issues. We have to look at it a little bit differently. And so we cannot be affirming of a lifestyle uh, like that, but we can be loving towards the person in the midst of it. Um, the last thing is this. How we care and respond is first determined by what we foundationally believe about the body and its created purpose. We're coming at things from two very different points of view, from two very different points of understanding. And listen, our definition of love, our definition of love means caring for you in a very different way than celebrating the brokenness of our hearts and minds and our bodies, but being with you as, we, as you go through that struggle. Listen, um, I, I, I think as a church, we need, we need to understand something. Um, people go where they are accepted. People will not hang around somewhere where they are not accepted. I think as time goes on, the church will need to get more and more used to people who have been taught by our culture that whatever you feel is what's real. And we're going to find more and more often people coming in a very broken state because they've made changes to their body. And they're going to find that that has not brought them happiness and the cure that they thought. What do I do now? Here's what we're going to do, church. We're going to love them. And we're going to say... I don't know. I'm not going to tell you I told you so. I'm not going to be angry at you. I'm not going to be frightened of you. And I know that God has redemption for you. And I'm frankly not sure what to do next. But we will do it with you.
we will be beside you. That's easy for us to say yes now. It is hard for us to say yes when that happens. And that will be a test for us. Will we be like God in a bod? Will we say the things I do in this body actually matter? Will I be a means of grace for someone who has walked the other way for a long, long time, but who now says, I did, it didn't work? Is it too late for me? We have to be the ones that say no. No. And I don't know what this looks like. But come on. We'll walk with you. Listen, we have to be humble in the midst of this. I know it is easy to look at our culture right now and to be angry. Because it's not like our culture was. It isn't. Can I tell you what? The changes, and come on Wednesday night, because we get pretty direct about when the changes all happened and things like that. The changes in our culture didn't happen over the last 20 years. They happened 300 years ago. And we're reaping what we've sown over those past 300 years. And you know what? It is easy for us to be angry online and to look like there is no place for anyone who has ever been, who has ever done anything uh, against God and make it look like this is not the place for you. But let me just tell you, I think the day is coming when a whole slew of the, of uh, transgender operations and things like that, people are going to just, just going to go, man, what do I do now? Because that didn't work. And one place that they will look for a few minutes will be the church. And if we are not there and ready to say, come on, let's walk together in this. Let's figure it out together in this. I don't know what it looks like from now on, but let's, let's figure it out together. If we are not there for that, or, and if we show them rejection at that point, they will assume, no, oh, there is no place for me. There is no place of redemption any longer. Here's the good news. You know what? Our world has a pretty narrow window of acceptance, doesn't it? A, a real celebration. As long as you look a certain way for a certain amount of time, the spotlight can shine on you. Or if you're ultra talented in some way, the spotlight can shine on you. You know what the family of God means? In the family of God, it means that because prayerfully we ask God to throw off the old ways of looking at things and we begin to see the world in a new way, we begin to celebrate things differently than the world does. We begin to see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ created in beauty and damaged by sin. Being healed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and by His sanctifying work. For some of you, the healing means there's been a deep anger and hatred in my heart that has to be cured and healed. For others of you, it means that there's been a sexual identity issue that has been broken in my life that needs to be restored. And both need to be healed. You know what we believe happened at the fall? When sin entered the world? We believe that it damaged us in four different ways. It damaged our sense of purpose. It, it, it damaged our... Oh man, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to mention two ways because I've forgotten the other two. <laughs> Damaged our sense of purpose. And there was another way that, that they called concupiscence. That's, a, that's an odd word. Anytime a big word's been used, just know somebody along the way blew it. All right? 
What that means is that our affections are now out of order. We love all the wrong things. Here's, here's one way I experience that. I was just thinking this week, man, I need to lose some weight. Not, not, not just because of my modeling career is at stake here. Um, but because I'm at an age where now I'm dealing with some high blood pressure issues. And the curly red hair girl, I'd like to be there for a while for her. And, and I, thought, I thought, I need to lose some weight. And I drove my Dairy Queen. <laughs> the very next thought was, so I probably ought to get a blizzard. <laughs> hey, don't tell me you, do stu- you don't do stuff like this. Do any of you do this stuff like this? Anybody that ever has ever done something like that, just say amen. Wave the hanky, right? Now, maybe you're the ultra-disciplined person. We bow down to you. Come on. You know, get on Facebook and be a social media influencer or something like that. But you know what? Our affections, what we love, is all out of order. We're no better than a puppy at understanding what is good for us and being able to follow through with it sometimes. It's because of the fall. And it's painful for us to change in that. If we can be out of order in just what kind of food we ought to eat, guess what? In more complicated things like love and identity, guess what? It's really screwed us up. In fact, the way some of us are broken here... The way some of us are broken here is that when we are single, we think our life would actually be better if it were just for a member of the opposite sex would come into our lives. Marriage will solve all of our problems, we think. Anybody here married that thinks they got that wrong? I think that way, Sherry. Just want you to know. Marriage will bring a whole new set of problems. Listen, listen. These are two very different ways of looking at things. And if we, if we don't get on board, our culture is very convincing. So convincing. So convincing. And this deals with more than just the obvious moral issues. What about transhumanism what about if I have the opportunity to jump higher and run farther because I get some set up like the six million dollar man and I choose to do those kinds of things is is that a good thing is that a bad thing what about this what if AI gets to the point where it is smart enough to take care of my kids is that a good thing or a bad thing You see, there are some issues where we need to understand that God has put his image in us. And there are some things that he has given image bearers to do. And when we take the image of God out of the equation, it's not done as well or the ball's been dropped and the brokenness continues. Listen. I was in a a group of people um, two weeks ago talking about the church. And and whenever you talk about the church, somebody gets on to complaining about how broken the church is. And and I made the smart out comment because I do this quite often. It's how God is trying to sanctify me. Um, And and, uh, and he's not given up yet, fortunately, but sometimes I do. And uh, anyway, I, I just in the midst of that said, you know, Jesus probably should have come and tried to save a much better quality of people, I guess. Jesus came in a real body to save real people. So that real people could be resurrected into his real kingdom. What we think about these issues is important and foundational to our outlook on the world 
And our world is more and more telling us that any viewpoint that has God at the top of it is not a real viewpoint that can be considered. Don't lose that ability. Don't lose that ability. Because God is doing a new thing and he can start it in you. Amen? Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, this is not an issue. This is life and blood human beings that we're talking about that struggle at a deep, deep level with identity in heartbreaking ways. And Lord, it's heartbreaking enough for me to think ahead for my granddaughter to think that, she, that she'll shed tears over her beautiful red hair that is curly someday. That, that breaks my heart because she can't see how beautiful that is. I can only imagine how it breaks your heart that we say this body It needs to be completely reworked. It's no good. Lord, you see us as beautiful. And even in our brokenness, Lord, you think there is something worth redeeming. And so our, my prayer is today that you would speak to us in such a way that it makes sense to our hearts of hearts. That we would know that your creation can be trusted and that these bodies were given so that we could point to you and to your incarnation. And Lord, your incarnation is so important because one day we will be invited to be resurrected just like you. Lord, make that true in our hearts. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of the tainted way that we see our world and help us see it anew in you. In Jesus' precious name. God bless you. Would you stand with us as we worship together?